to start us out, I would love to tell a little bit of background on David and Susan. Now, David said, make it short, Cindy, uh, but I want to make sure to give voice to all that David and Susan have done in our community as they share a deep passion for the arts and for their local communities as, as we know and appreciate and are grateful for here in Roanoke as well as beyond. And I'm gonna start with a quote from David and, and, and I shared this actually with our interns as they were doing some research on this exhibition. And David, as you were CEO and chairman, of the board and Norfolk Southern, you were quoted to say in business, the challenge is to spark the creativity that will make a business great. In both business and the arts, you have to find the right combination, one that ignites creativity and manages the bottom line. And you have given back in your vision and leadership and to weave the arts and the company as that, as that time frame of Norfolk Southern Foundation. And I know as I came to this community uh, over a decade ago, and that was definitely part of you know, those grants that came back to so many organizations and nonprofits and arts and culture throughout, um, throughout the region. So we thank you for that. And you have been so active across, across the state um, and, and in many of organizations, you, as we've talked, um, you know, being able to capture that oral history of your timing too, as chairman of the board of this museum in the, in the 70s and, and 80s. Um, and Susan, your continued, um, your work on the board and leadership for both of you here at the museum. But that, that work really continues across the state at the, at the Chrysler Museum the Virginia Arts Festival, the Virginia Symphony, um, the John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts, Philadelphia Orchestra. So continues across in, in many different functions, uh, your vision, leadership, and commitment to the arts. Um, really that untiring efforts to increase business involvement with the arts have spurred the growth and appreciation of that. And that, you know, Susan, um, as a retired educator and community leader, the arts and the education have been so important. Uh, active volunteer and board leader so for also so many organizations, including Virginia Symphony, Norfolk Commission of the Arts, the Humanities, the American for the Arts. And I remember as um, I visited one, one time in Norfolk and you had um, the beautiful um, Jeff Coons balloon doll that was actually a dog that was a gift um, for your work and recognition um, from American for the Arts and that, and that award uh, on that part. And David and Susan were honored uh, with the Governor's Arts Award for their work on behalf of the arts across the Commonwealth of Virginia and um, where that vision and generosity really continue in the arts in the local community. So I thank you. I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Carl Willers, who's our chief curator and deputy director of exhibitions and collections. And we're gonna go ahead and tag team on this with Carl, myself and David and Susan. And so if you have questions, go ahead and put it in the chat. I'll weave those in, but we will also have time at the end for questions with David, Susan, Charles, and Anita. Hello, everybody. Um, this is Carl Willers, and we are so pleased to be having this preview of Enduring Voices, African-American Art from the David R. and Susan S. Good Collection. And uh, we're the first painting like here in, in the exhibition is this William H. Johnson. Uh, from fairly early within his career from 1928 and he had gone to Paris in 1926 to study and this early work is um, you know is distinguished by an expressionist style that's slightly influenced by cubism in Europe but um, keep this in mind because later within the show we're going to see a, a magnificent later uh, William Johnson that's in the good collection and it's, it's quite a different style. And you'll see here that as the video continues to play that enduring voices and that, that coloring of the branding of the exhibition continues down through the hallway. So we selected that you could really give voice and space to each artist um, as you walk down the hallway and then into the good gallery. 
David or Susan might want to comment on this piece. It's by Benny Andrews. It's um, an untitled piece, but um, the subtitle Museum Tour from about 1960. You know, Benny Andrews uh, found great uh, success as an African American artist in New York City in the early 19 or from the early 1960s when he arrived in New York City, and throughout much of the rest of his career, he was very much um, activist. Um, within the arts, started many art programs for, for prisoners. And actually, um, one of my first contacts with Benny Andrews was when um, in the early 1980s, uh, did an exhibition on prison art projects, uh, both, um, both by professional artists and by um, men that were incarcerated and in like arts programs. And Benny Andrews was like a, an incredible resource for um, a lot of information about um, you know helping that community that um, and um, he's well known for really reflecting the world around him. We told uh, we told uh, Carl a little earlier that museum tour is a good start for uh, mm -hmm. uh, for, for an exhibit like this and uh, in some ways so is Benny uh, uh, is uh, Johnson and, and Benny Andrews because they also represent that kind of link between uh, the, uh, the folk and outsider tradition, which, uh, uh, which comes up in several ways in here and was uh, part of the story as to how Susan and I began with this uh, quest. I would say, yes, very much picking up on that. Um, the next work is a sculpture by William Edmondson who was based um, in Nashville and surrounding areas, but um, very much an outsider art artist. He was inspired by God um, to, and started working on tombstones, actually in his own yard for the African-American community. And um, the minimalism and simplicity of his sculptures was uh, really resonated with um, you know, people you know, throughout the nation. And he, um, he eventually, you know, began doing not only teams, tombstones, but, but these sculptural objects. Yeah, we love this one because it, it it's very minimalist, but it has great attitude. I mean, he just, he, he, he's just strutting along. And when we, when, when we, when we uh, got this, it was very much part of uh, sort of our outsider uh, folk, folk collection, although Edmondson, uh, is now in the uh, reinstalled uh, Museum of Modern Art and in the Whitney. So, hey, <laughs> think times change. Moving further down the main hallway, uh, there is a magnificent Bob Thompson on view. Um, you know, Bob Thompson had a fairly short life, um, and he started his this mature body of work in the late 1950s and into the 1960s, where he was reinterpreting, reinterpreting European paintings from the Renaissance, the Baroque, and even up to early 20th century. But as, you know, as parables about contemporary American life and the issues of racial relations. And next, I think we're going to like, just um, is Elizabeth Catlett's Naima, my granddaughter from 1998 an absolutely gorgeous Catlett sculpture that I'd be very curious, like, you know, um, how, you know, you know, how David and Susan, you know, came to acquire and, and uh, just love this object. I'll tell you how it came about. We went up and he was showing us a completely different thing. And I saw that across the room <laughs> and I said, that is the one that we want. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very striking. And uh, we have a uh, we have a large uh, wood cat, uh, catlet, which uh, at the moment is being shown by another museum. I, saw, I think I saw Lloyd DeWitt on here earlier. <laughs> uh, and so it, 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 it was not available for this because it's uh, on display at the Chrysler at the moment. Uh, but uh, there and and there's quite a collection of uh, of catlets uh, in uh, in in uh, Eastern Virginia because there is a, there there are some connections uh, 
here, but uh, we we were familiar with her work. But this is a, but this was quite unusual because it is marble, and that was not her usual uh, medium. She worked much more in wood and and bronze, and I think we have a print later on. We'll see. There is this mystical relationship between sculptors and printmakers. Somehow, that's another. That's another. Uh, 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 Carl, that's another exhibition we can do sometime. It's that's very true. That's very true. Elizabeth Catlin would definitely have to be part of that. A major, major printmaker during her later career in Mexico. And um, next is a absolutely incredible Beaufort Delaney, which is titled Maconde Figure. Um, it's from 1952. An absolutely, you know fabulous like um you know piece by Delaney and shows his the influence of African art upon upon his own work you know Delaney went to Paris in 1953 and was there just for a short visit but he spent the rest of his life in that city um very much as an expatriate um and uh you know did the remainder of his work from um 1953 um there in Paris, he was a mentor to um, many African American figures who um, chose to make their homes in Paris. Um, he was a mentor to James Baldwin, and um, toward the end of his life, um, of Delaney's life, he had um, some um, tragic, you know, difficulties, and was eventually like institutionalized. At that point, James Baldwin really became his caretaker. He's, he's much better, Delaney is much better known for his total abstracts and for his portraits of people like James Baldwin and, and other famous African-Americans of the time. And, uh, but uh, he had, a, he, he had a, an interest for a short time in African sculpture. And he did, I think, six or seven paintings uh, like, this, uh, like this one of, uh, of African sculpture. Yeah, and we have the, uh, <laughs> have, have the one that he, was purported to have used for this sculpture. And looking at the two, they really do uh, look like this was a, a uh, rendering of that particular sculpture, but it's very small. Well, and that's that's in your home, it's right underneath it. So I know that's, you know, part of, um, yeah. you know, as we can see behind you too, you really live with your art. And, you know, this might be a good place to to ask that question too about you know the groupings that you have in you know your different residencies and in the um, what we borrowed here for this exhibition all came from your from your Norfolk home. Well, we could walk into the next room. Uh, we are back in Norfolk from Key West. We could walk into the next room and see uh, uh, see several bare spots on the walls where you have denuded <laughs> the uh, the house, but we do. Uh, uh, we do hang most of the works that are in this. Uh, um, maybe all of them come from our uh, from Norfolk, but we have uh, we, we have a place in Key West where uh, we have quite a bit of Cuban and uh, and and uh, Key West Cuba Cuban American uh, and and some Afro Cuban American uh, uh, artworks down there, and then uh, New York, and we live with our work. Mm -hmm. right. And we miss, and we'll miss this, but we're happy to have it there. <laughs> well, thank you for for sharing with with all of us in our community. And this is a little bit later work, a Whitfield level called "Beauty Without Regret" from two thousand and four. It's very indicative of um, Whitfield's style, in which he calls images of African Americans or photographs from the black of African Americans from the um, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and draws them in this beautiful, um, you know, charcoal style, often on um, panel wood and um, other surfaces. Um, and uh, Lovell is, is very interested in the people, you know, that, you know, in these anonymous photographs, um, and often juxtaposes them with found objects or objects that are, you know, cold, called from like um, from junk stores, and um, and they sort of reverberate with with um, very interesting meanings. I think they're particularly interesting because they're always sort of ambiguous. 
Mm -hmm. and it's up to the person looking at it to figure out, you know, why does she have all these? And these are bullet casings that are in front of it. Okay. You know, is, was somebody killed? Uh, you know, is she mourning a husband? What, what's happening there? And, and there's always a, a, a different ways you can interpret every painting. And uh, I fell in love with I fell in love with his work. Whitfield is, uh, uh, it, it, I, we, we have been talking about perhaps we can entice Whitfield to come to, uh, to Roanoke and talk about his work, since I think there are three of them in, uh, in yeah. the exhibit. That's right. And, and, and when did you meet Whitfield? And, and, and that's one of the questions of, you know, how do you discover new artists? And, and well, what, we, met what him, we, like? we met him as a result of, uh, uh, he's represented by a, a gallery, and we had bought a Jacob Lawrence, which we'll see later uh, uh, at that uh, at that gallery, and uh, we were introduced to Whitfield early on. We have several of his of his works, and have gotten to know him a little bit. He's most interesting. Uh, and he's most had interesting some. Not, we've done some. There, I know it. He was at the uh, uh, museum of uh, modern art here in. Uh, in Virginia Beach, but I think we saw some of his work even earlier than that. Yeah, he has uh, connections with Virginia. He has, uh, uh, he, and he, he did a very large re reconstruction uh, mm. of, uh, 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 of paintings on on uh, uh, in a really in a room of a house that he built. It's an interesting story. We could talk all night on Whitfield, but we probably need to move along. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and it's wonderful. There's three works in the exhibition and the exhibit design really, uh, as you stand in front of this work and then you look over into the Goud Gallery, you'll be able to, to see the other two works from, from Whitfield. So it's a, it's a connection right there. And the way the show laid out so beautifully, it created this, um, the Goud Gallery is really devoted to the works on paper which is very proper because um, you know, the lighting levels can be kept low, but uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful presentation. Pan around here to look at the Elizabeth Catlett uh, print, Girl Jumping Rope uh, from 1958. And uh, as David said, um, Catlett was also a major, major printmaker, um, especially within her um, later years where she resided in Mexico. And now we're looking down a wall of Romare Bearden's, both Carolina Reunion of 1975 that you just saw. This was Pepper Jolly Lady of 1980. And I think we're gonna stop here and talk about this magnificent. Um, well, this is the one, this is, this is the painting that started it all in a way, uh, other than the, the, our little dabbling in folk art and, and outsider that we had some early, but this was the, uh, the first really serious African-American painting we acquired, and we acquired it for a very simple reason, and that is Susan loved it. Yeah, I saw it in the, uh, it was hanging in the office of uh, the people that run the gallery, and I felt it was a very compelling, I mean, it's very simple, but it's very compelling, and uh, of course I admired it, and uh, the next thing I knew I had bought it, but uh, I've never regretted that. A, it's a wonderful painting. And uh, if you look at his other paintings, he had, they're, they're different, but the palette is the same. You've got those blues and the greens. And, and in fact, when I looked at it, I had no idea it was Romare Bearden. I just knew that it was a wonderful piece of art. And then, uh, of course, once I knew it was a Romare Bearden, I said, oh yeah, yeah. Those and, are the colors. And it, and it is, well, of course, Bearden is an interesting an important figure in African American art in uh, Harlem, uh, and and uh, all of that. Uh, and but he is from Charlotte, interestingly, and uh, and the uh, this this painting is a little atypical of Bearden's, but it's an it's a very early work, and uh, uh, this has been Bearden is Bearden. I think his hundredth anniversary was. A few years ago, and there are several major Bearden shows. This this painting is has this painting has been out of our house a lot more than it has been in our house. 
it's a beautiful, beautiful image. And yeah, and striking it, it because it is a watercolor and gouache. As we move on, I think we're going to see one more work by by Bearden, the Cyclops from 1977. And like many of Bearden's like best known works, it is a collage of papers and graphite. And it was that collage work that also connected Bearden so closely to um, to 20th century modernism. And there, and he did he did this series called the Black Odyssey, which uh, is a very a, a very important series. And there's a book. Uh, uh, there's a Black Odyssey book. I mean, it's it's most uh, most Bearden is a fascinating uh, artist worth study on his own. We have, uh, in addition to the ones that are in here, several other Bearden works, and he led us then to other uh, uh, other artists like Jacob Lawrence, who may be coming up. I don't know. Yep, um, just right around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> we before we get to Jacob Lawrence though, there is one more William H. Johnson, a later piece from 1945 oh. called like on a John Brown flight. It was and, very uh, different from the first one you saw, which was very much uh, influenced by the uh, art in Europe. And he came back and went to a completely different style. So, uh, this looks like it could be a, a, a almost a folk uh, a folk piece, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the style that uh, that Johnson chose to adopt when he came back to the United States. But there is nothing outsider or untaught about William H. Johnson. He is absolutely classically trained, and uh, uh, as you could see from the very first painting in this. Uh, uh, he has a body of work that uh, could be shown, and you would think of it as from the French post-impressionist uh, period. Uh, and uh, but it, and he studied and uh, studied in France, was there for a long time. Came back to this country and adopted the style you see here. He did a lot of jazz dancers and others, quite quite uh, an important uh, figure. But it's. Uh, but it's fascinating to think about Johnson's own mindset in returning to his homeland and adopting uh, quite a different uh, 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 style of, of expressing himself. I find this much more appealing than the, uh, than the classic myself. And then we are gonna get to the Jacob Lawrence pieces. This this particularly beautiful work is called The Prayer from 1954. You know, Lawrence was really um, became, you know, quite famous as a major participant in the Harlem Renaissance um, and r really um, started his career with several major um, series of narratives about African-American history and historical figures like the Migration series and, um, other works, but um, very much a central figure within the Harlem Renaissance of the 1930s and 1940s. This this work uh, uh, speaks to the difference, but uh, to to what it means to have paintings in your home, because this while it is while while it is a classic Jacob Lawrence and has all of the elements of Lawrence, in it, but you you have to be close to it. And look at it closely because it's much too small for for a museum. It, it's okay in the small good gallery uh, there, Cindy, that you have, but uh, it uh, but it it expresses it. But it's very much not, uh, it, it is very much a painting for the home as opposed to a painting for the museum. Although I think you'll I think people will look at it and enjoy it. But uh, when you come into our house in Norfolk, it's right there in the entry. And I will say that that's one of my favorite pa uh, paintings. And it's so intimate. And I think it was very personal to him because uh, it was about, you know, the prayer before thing. And it, uh, it was one that he thought highly of. And in fact, gave it as a gift to a, a corporation which parted with it for the very reason that David said it was too small for uh, for for their uh, walls. 
Well, and this is one of my favorites too, when in your home, uh, when you, when you enter and you can get really intimate with it. So, uh, you're, you're right in terms of the walls of the museum, but I think the, the visitor will be able to get up close too. but it is, yeah. it's, it's one of my favorites as well. Well, that's a beautifully intimate interior. The other Jacob Lawrence is a street scene, uh, you know, probably of, of Harlem during the, this was painted in uh, a gouache on paper painted in 1975 called Other Rooms. Definitely a, fr from, a, from a Harlem series that he did. Uh, next, we have a beautiful series of lithographs by the artist Kara Walker. Um, it's the Porgy and Bess print suite from 2013. Uh, the four, you know, four images in the suite, um, Porgy and Crown, Porgy and Bess, Strawberry Woman, and Sailboat and Storm. I think the, um, the one there on the right is, is um, very much um, Strawberry Woman, and on the left you see um, Porgy and Bess. Uh, yeah, Porgy and Bess is the opera that um, was actually like um, restaged just last year in New York City at the Metropolitan Opera was, was some, has always been somewhat controversial. Uh, it's depiction of, of some stereotypical like types within, within the black community, but an absolute masterpiece of American, American music and opera. And a little bit further over Whitfield level, other two pieces are here. I think we're gonna stop on this which is Ken 56 um, Revolution from 2011. And I, I guess we're wondering, David, whether you are particularly attracted to the trains. We, uh, uh, we as, as you said, we got to know uh, Whitfield a little bit with the, and, and the gallery, uh, uh, Bridget Moore, who has a gallery that represents uh, uh, Whitfield. And of course, he, uh, uh, of course, we, uh, Susan and I have some connection to the railroad business, uh, as people in Roanoke well know. And uh, this is a work that Whitfield did right after he took sort of a sabbatical because he received a MacArthur, one of these MacArthur uh, uh, genius genius awards that uh, that are given, and uh, and he took some time off, and then when he came back. Uh, uh, his uh, uh, his gallery uh, uh, person Bridget Moore called us and said said uh, Bridget uh, said Whitfield has brought over a, uh, a a work that I think you will want and I I laughed when I saw it because uh, I have and, and we, I don't know uh, whether this is true or not but I I thought well Whitfield who works with found materials and the uh, photographs as you were talking earlier. Uh, Carl, uh, I, I think found these trains and knew that this, and, and, and knew that someone who was interested in trains might be interested in this. But I think it's quite a compelling image. I think it's also because is she watching somebody leave or is she going to get on the train and go north? Because this the, during the mig Great Migration. See, that's why Susan is better at this than I am. She yeah. thinks about that. I just see the train interesting. There's one more level within the exhibition untitled card 39. Number 30 is a charcoal on paper with an attached playing card. It's very intimate little work. It's only about 12 by nine inches. And, and there, then, there happen to be 52 of them. <laughs> 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 and this, um, one of the last works on paper in the, in the gallery is um, by Faith Ringel, who um, sh um, she's very well known. This piece let me, is um, called Tar Beach 1993, which was also the title of a book that she did in 1991 that won um, tremendous fame and recognition as a children's book. And that book itself was taken um, from a, um, a tapestry and a quilt that she had made. And um, her tapestries and quilts, which began, I think, in the early 1980s, yes, in 1980, um, were really a way that she in incorporated narratives, wove narratives into or, or sewed narratives um, into the quilts 
that um, were often then like transformed into um, a, a range of books, which have, um, have which have also you know, gained her great fame. This is another example of a of, of a small work, uh, which is hard to see on the uh, on the screen. But when you come to the Taubman and look at this carefully, there's a lot in this uh, in this work. Well, we're so glad we were able to include that. I know you have another work of Faith Ringgold in, in New York, and we will be using the children's book in our virtual programming uh, for the schools. I was going to say, and now we have the Betty Sar with, <laughs> with, 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 uh, on its special pedestal. Very much so. This is As the Crow Flies from 2010. And, and uh, we, we were interested in Betty. We were, well, we just... Susan and I both fell in love with Betty Sarr, who uh, who works with uh, found materials, and we have had we uh, we acquired this uh, uh, fairly early on. Uh, as a, and it uh, if if you can come to see it, it represents a uh, a slave ship uh, coming to uh, coming to America, and it's made entirely of found materials with uh, uh, with with all sorts of images in the. Uh, in the work, but uh, the other story, and I think she may be watching them, uh, maybe on this, I didn't see whether Cindy, yeah, I saw Cindy. whether Cindy yes. Wynn is on here or not, but this was in our house on a, on a plain back black uh, pedestal and Cindy Wynn, who, uh, who works like Betty Sarr with found materials and uh, uh, saw it and, and, pretty much decided that she wanted to make a pedestal for it. And she constructed this wonderful stand that now uh, uh, is almost part and parcel of the <laughs> of, of this. And I think it's, uh, we have a number of sculptural works in our house. And uh, I think this is one of the most successful uh, joinings of pedestal with uh, sculptural work that uh, 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 that I have seen, uh, I, I, I would love to get Betty Sar down sometime to see this and see how she feels about it. Uh, but uh, Betty Sar is a major, major African American uh, uh, worker who is whose work is just fabulous in a lot of ways. Uh, she does, she is works in every medium, and uh, this is a sort of a classic her, example yeah. of her. Uh, of her work with found, sculptural work with found materials. It is definitely a stunning piece from Betty Sarr. And as you said, that that adjoining with the with the pedestal as, as a sculptural work in itself. Uh, and Cindy Wynn is on the call uh, this evening. And Cindy, if you'd like to unmic yourself and tell us a little bit about that process and you know uh, that commissioned work as you were creating for uh, Betty Sarr's uh, stunning sculpture to be uh, atop of it. Well, it's, it's a real thrill to work with such strong artwork. I always try, uh, as an artist, I've been working, when I met David and Susan, I've been working 20, in my late 20s, something about 26 years, I'd already been making furniture. And you never know as an artist when the next true inspiration is gonna come, but meeting David and Susan and getting to work with some of their incredible artwork has been amazing and a real mm -hmm. thrill. And it, it takes me about, after I see the work and examine it and take pictures, it takes me about nine months to really come formulate an idea. And my whole goal is always to make it my work, but also make sure that it doesn't upstage the, um, the, the real art um, at all in any way. And one thing you can't tell about this piece is that the pedestal goes around and so you can see all sides, the top spins, and at that, I'm not much of a mechanic, and it worked out beautifully. <laughs> I've made some pedestals that went around, and they were not level in any way. <laughs> well, this is uh, uh, if you came to our house, you would see that there are several. So, since she did this, Cindy's kind of gotten into it, and. Uh, has become the pedestal maker of choice here. 
But we it, have easily half a dozen pedestals. Our, uh, we, we have a, 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 a large pre a selection of pre-Columbian, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Lloyd DeWitt knows, and uh, several of them work very well on pedestals. Um, it has been abandoned like, by... Uh, it, it's a whole interesting question, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but Betty Sarr's piece here in the center of the gallery is very appropriate because... I do think that uh, Betty Saar is a uh, uh, sort of a seminal and important uh, uh, figure in African American uh, African American art. You'll notice that most of our work is not uh, was not done today or yesterday or even last year, uh, um, but uh, we we uh, 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 we we have. Uh, uh, have gotten more and more interested in sort of the roots of uh, of African American art and, and and its place as part of the of, of the class of, of of what you think of as the classic American art uh, art scene and uh, so uh, th that's that's the theme that is in this collection and that Cindy picked up when she paid us a visit I think. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> now, then, we just finished the tour. So, of the, of, you know, through the galleries, that continuity, um, giving each artist space and voice, uh, the enduring voices of the African American art from, from your collection. Did anything surprise you? And what's your first impressions? Uh, it looks very different in the gallery because. As you may notice, if you, I don't know how much you can see behind us, but uh, we have art everywhere. And it was very interesting because there is all very well spaced and you see it in different, different ways. Um, the, uh, the, the Bearden's, uh, the Bearden's, for example, uh, uh, occupy a wall in our, uh, in our living room. The opposite wall is a wall of the Wyeth family. Susan, Susan, of course, is from Wilmington, from the Wilmington, Delaware area, and uh, and has an interest in the Brandywine painters, and we have all the Wyeths, and so so the Bearden's are paired with Wyeths, and uh, the uh, uh, and, and so it's it, it it is very different because they are not there next to the Jacob Lawrence, the Jacob Lawrences are elsewhere, but the, but really they belong. Uh, uh, more or less uh, it, together. It's just, it, it is quite interesting. It's always interesting to me to see how different uh, work that you know and live with looks uh, when it's shown in a museum. Uh, and uh, this, uh, I said to, uh, to Carl earlier that the, uh, the, the presentation of this in the gallery, and I can't wait to actually get to Roanoke and, uh, and, and see this, is so clean and 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 well organized that it uh, it presents the art in quite a different way. Uh, I must say that the presentation of that Betty Saar in the middle of the gallery is it is is a uh, tour de force. Mm -hmm. And it really it brings well, you yeah, down the gallery hallway. Yeah, we don't have it uh, organized by whether they're black artists, women artists. Uh, you know, whatever kind of art is, it's all mixed together. The, uh, so it's interesting to sort of <laughs> pick out all the... Yeah, the, uh, the Elizabeth Catlett uh, uh, marble, for example, is, uh, is presented in our dining room with a Feininger uh, train, train picture. Uh, and, and, and they work extremely well together, I must say. <laughs> Well, actually, that's a great segue. We have two images of when, you know, on my multiple visits that I took and, you know, just to that uh, you know, comment is here it is in your home, which of course looks different than in the galleries, but just is so stunning. Yeah, mm -hmm. with, the, with, the, with the fighting, with the fighting yeah, behind it. I mean, no relationship, but they work. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then on the next slide, we'll show the Romeo Bearden, which are above your, your couch, which you mentioned, if you went into the other room, that would be empty. 
And, you know, that's a difference too. The, these two are together uh, above the couch where in the gallery, the four, you know, Carl made that choice in terms of the four, uh, Roman Bearden and the, you know, the curation on that wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they work very well there. They, they're very, uh, you know, they, they draw your attention to that area. And then we've got a woman artist to the, uh, well, we actually right to the left, we have the, uh, oh, uh, oh, what is that? The, uh, draw it blank. And then we have, we have uh, the Bernstein, one of the, uh, well, Teresa yeah, the, Bernstein, the, the Teresa uh, Bernstein, who's uh, completely uh, different, who is a completely <laughs> different thing. Uh, and of course. she has a, you know, has a picture of, of an orchestra. And then on the other side, we have what we have the uh, uh, the the, the, the home. Uh, if you can, if you come into our home, you will see that there. The, you you have Cindy uh, presented a number of African American works, which is which which is interesting, and we have developed an interest in that. But if you look behind us on the uh, on on the image that I think is on the screen, you see that. Uh, you see, there are a couple of people, a couple of pieces of very contemporary uh, uh, glass sculpture, and a and a George Rickey, small George Rickey piece at the base of that, and uh, several several very contemporary pieces that, and and all of these works live together somehow, uh, and whether it makes whether it would make sense to a museum person, I don't know. But to Susan and me, there are pieces that we have loved for some reason over the years and bought and uh, and enjoy living with. Uh, that's and they, I mean that's the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we you know, we have the. I was trying to think of the Pendergast is the one that we have on the other side of there. So I mean, it's just yeah. a whole, whole <laughs> mixture. Hodgepodge. It's hodgepodge. Well, but and I think that together. Yeah. And those are those enduring voices that you know we, we see in the exhibition and that speak to you as collectors and you sharing with our community. And with that, you know, thank you, uh, David and Susan. We we're going to um, also take that leap to that celebration as we celebrate the voices of the artists in the exhibition of enduring voices and also the artists and leaders in our community. And so we'd like to invite uh, Charles and Anita Price as, as we um, find out a little bit more about the Harrison uh, Museum of African American Culture. And we've collaborated with uh, the Harrison over the years and look forward to that continued celebration and collaboration, especially as we kick off the celebration of Black History Month. And a little bit about Anita and Charles. Um, Anita James Price uh, is an educator and uh, has taught at Patrick Henry High School for 10 years, but also a really a lifelong educator. Uh, Vice Mayor Price devoted her platform as an advocate for children, youth, and their families. And Charles, Charles Price Jr. serves as the executive director of the Harrison and has um, served on many boards in terms of Center in the Square, Roanoke Higher Education, and Total Action for Progress. And with that, we're gonna uh, show a short video of Charles and Anita. And we've woven in, I've woven in a number of questions, David and Susan, as we went through the gallery tour. And then at the end, we're gonna open up the mics and um, continue with the enduring voices in the galleries and in our communities and um, ask, um, questions as we move forward. The Harrison Museum of African American Culture is an educational and cultural institution committed to advocating, showcasing, preserving, and celebrating in, in our community. Tell us a little bit about the beginnings of uh, the Harrison. Well, the Harrison uh, Museum was originally housed in the Harrison School, which has a very, very rich history. Um, it was first 
uh, had a principal by the name of Lucy Addison, who in 1917 came to Roanoke to, to begin uh, working at the school. But at that time, it only went up to the eighth grade. And dear Miss Addison lobbied the Virginia State uh, Board of Education to explain how important it was for African American children to get an education beyond eighth grade. So finally, through her efforts, uh, the, the school was accredited uh, and became, and, be, and started offering high school credits. But it wasn't until uh, after she had retired that a dedicated high school was built, and that school was subsequently named after her. That's the Lucy Addison School that we know of today. Wonderful. And Charles, the museum, how did it become what it is today? Well, um, really it was an, an educator that brought about the opportunity to um, use the Harrison as a historical marker, but also as a museum. During that time frame, most of the elementary schools or schools that served the African American community were being uh, removed from the landscape, uh, either through fire or, or, or demo demolition. And, um, and so Ms. Hazel Thompson um, was the individual who pushed to have the Harrison Building uh, saved and put on land, a landmark, but really pushed it so that it could house and be utilized for history of the uh, African American community. And in 1985, um, the, we were um, established as the Harrison Museum in the Harrison School. And we occupied the lower level of the building and the upper two floors were dedicated to housing. And recently you had an exhibition, Through Our Eyes, Black Fatherhood of the Arts and a showcasing depicting positive images of black fatherhood. Tell us about that. It, it was um, a, a, an exhibit that was uh, in collaboration with some other folks, uh, Ryan Bell and um, the Black Fathers uh, or, uh, organization. And um, we were discussing opportunities to do different things and this presented itself as something that would be unique in that we were featuring uh, five uh, local, local. Artists, mm -hmm. artists, one from the Lynchburg area, a couple from Richmond, but the majority uh, were from the Roanoke area. And there were various mediums that they used in, in presenting their artwork uh, from actual brush to um, um, pencil um, to um, um, we had uh, also um, ca uh, carvings that were done uh, by a young lady uh, out of Richmond. And it was very unique in that uh, each artist um, presented about anywhere from three to four pieces of their work. Uh, during that time frame. And we had a lecture associated with that as well. Um, and that was the opening of, of that particular exhibit. Um, the, uh, the, the emphasis was to depict the capabilities and quality of the work that these people were doing uh, that sometimes doesn't get the notoriety that mm -hmm. they should be getting or could be getting. Thank you for sharing those voices in, in our community and that, that continues as you kick off a lecture series during Black History Month and tell us about that. There's a number of focuses that really relate and align back to the mission of the Harrison Museum of African American Culture. Well, we're really excited to, with the, the vast array of the, the speakers that we have lined up. And we wanted to make certain that we address topics that are relevant, not only to the African American uh, community, but actually, you know, everyone can benefit from hearing uh, what these celebrated speakers have to say in relations to, to medicine and health care, education, and then there's also a line of, of some wonderful, talented young people who have been able to achieve their dreams. 
amazing and amazing lineup and I look forward to our continued collaboration and the voices of shining in our community. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Anita and Charles, uh, sharing with us. And that's just right across the street from the, the Tallman, as we know, located in Center in the Square, the Harrison Museum of African American Culture. And I look forward to participating virtually in many of those lectures uh, in February and in March. And also, as David and Susan said, uh, hopefully bringing in Whitfield to Roanoke, either in person or virtually, as we be able to invite visitors into the gallery and I'm going to open it up for questions. A deep thank you to both David and Susan Good for sharing their collection um, with the, our community, but also um, this evening and being able to, to hear uh, background and um, behind the scenes stories. And a thank you to Charles and Anita Price um, who are on the call too. So open it up for questions. Um, I'll check in the chat or you can unmic yourself as well. So one has come through, David and Susan, and you know, is there anything, uh, you know, a collection regret that you had that you were looking to 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 acquire and it just didn't work out? Excuse all me. Right. Susan said the regrets are always what you don't do. Yeah, but uh, for whatever reason, uh, and of course, a lot of sometimes it, it's impossible because when we were first starting out. Uh, a painting that was $500 might have well been $5 million because we didn't have that kind of money. So the example that, that comes to my mind is Faith Ringgold. We have a very small work of uh, Faith Ringgold, but Susan and uh, she uh, uh, worked with uh, the Americans for the Arts uh, some years ago, and uh, you work in, uh, with arts organizations. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, we, we could have, we, 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 we wanted a, a Faith Ringgold quilt. And that would be really nice to have. I bet the Talmud would like to have that, but it would be nice to have. Instead, we have a small work and I'm glad we did that. Uh, but you, you know, you meet people. Uh, I was happy to see Charles Price. I know Susan, uh, Susan and I remember Charles back from the old arts days in Roanoke. The, uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, the, certainly it's a, uh, yeah, I will say that it's a pleasure for Susan and me to have, uh, I, I, I didn't know Cindy we were going to, but it's, uh, it is certainly a, a pleasure for us to be associated with uh, this uh, loan to the, to the Tomlin and the, uh, and the exhibition to have association and work with the, the Harrison because as a, as a native of the Royal Valley, I certainly remember well the history of Lucy Addison and the Harrison, and uh, and and and, 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 the, <laughs> and the rich and the rich story that that uh, that represent that that represents, which really does deserve to be told more and more. That, and it's uh, wonderful to have that collaboration continue and it will continue into the summer. Uh, we have some plans as the Harrison ha is inviting a couple of photographers and will be on exhibition and we'll also you know, be able to, to recognize and, and lift up the voices as Anita said of the different community leaders and local talent. So I appreciate that as well in your comment, um, David and Susan. And um, I'm going to welcome also um, uh, Charles and Anita. You know, talk a little bit more about the the upcoming speaker series, which ties and uplifts um, education, healthcare, and art. One of the things, as, as we you know mentioned uh, earlier in the series, we're trying to to bring to light and make certain that folks have an opportunity to you you can't address what you don't first acknowledge. On behalf of Charles and I, we just want to say thank you very much while we have this opportunity to, um, to say we have enjoyed these collaborations. And we certainly um, want to thank uh, David and Susan Good for, for bringing their marvelous, unbelievable collection to the Star City. So thank you all. 
Thank you very much. It's certainly work that we enjoy. And uh, for that reason, we enjoy sharing it with people. I don't want to believe in having art that you just keep in your house and nobody gets to see it but you. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to end with a quote from Betty Sarr. And I am intrigued with combining the remnant of memories, fragments of relics and ordinary objects with the components of technology. It's a way of delving into the past and reaching into the future simultaneously. The art itself becomes the bridge. And so with that, um, I look forward to that art and bridging together. Thank you for joining us for Curated Cribs. I'm Cindy Peterson, Executive Director at the Tama Museum of Art.